Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Okay. Before we start, we're going to kneel and have a word of prayer. If you we can. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, which is in heaven, we thank you that we have privilege of coming before you on this holy day. Father, we are asking for you to be with us, for you to ac accept our praises, our words that we're going to share, and those that we're going to hear that we might not be just hearers only, but doers of your word. Bless our time here together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On our table, I believe inside of our trays, we have our opening hymn. And Josania, what is our opening hymn today? Number 538. 538. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Guide me, O the great Jehovah, pilgrims through the sparing land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hands. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no going to sing the memory verse. Um, those who practice the sunlight version can come and sing it. Now 
you can come and sing with the way that you are. Instruction and be wise, and be wise, and be wise. Hear instruction and be wise, and refuse it not. Proverbs 8.33 Um, there's some memory verses that are are somewhere close to you all. Somewhere under, somewhere near the table. So what she's saying is that she has memory verse uh, somewhere around you. So you have to go for hunting, looking for them. Okay. Okay. All right. So, what are we going to do, parents? We're going to help them put it in order. Okay. So, children, what was the first um, first word of our memory verse? Here. Here. And what is the second word? Instruction. Who has instruction? Start with the letter I. Good. Instruction. And what is the next word? And be wise. Let's see. Who has and be wise? Daniel. Daniel. Good. You could. Can you help him? There we go. Good job. Okay. And be. What is the next word? And be wise and. Refuse it not. Delia has it. Yeah. And where do we find the memory verse? Proverbs 8.33. Proverbs 8.33. Okay, and Naomi has Proverbs 8.33. Okay, thank you for your help. Okay. Can you pass the color? Okay. All right. Now, on your table, we also, according to our memory verse, we're going to kind of uh, break down or dissect this word here. Okay? Here. Very simple word, but it has a lot of meaning behind it, right? Here. So on your table, you have, not, not every table, but some, you have um, example or clues of another, another word that defi defines the word here. Here. It's another uh, similar to here. 
Uh huh. I see it. Here. Okay, I have an ear here. So when you hear the word hear, what do we need so we could be able to hear? Ear. Of course, we need an ear. And what do we do with our ear? Listen. We okay. listen. Good job, Aaron. So that means that uh, another synonym of hear is to listen. To listen. Okay? So listen. And then it also means to obey. Now, on the second table, we have something there. It's a big animal, but it's, it's obedient. It's very obedient. What is that? Elephant. Elephant, right? So that reminds us to obey. So you use your ear to hear, and then when you obey, you show in that you listen, that you understood what has been said to you. Okay? So when you look at the word hear, think about obey, listen, understand, okay? So obey, listen, understand, instruction, and you will be wise and refuse it not. Okay, very simple, but it helps you understand it better when you go to look at it, when you break down the word and look at it. Okay, I believe now it's time for Jael. All right, and during my time, I want 100% interaction with all my guests. And that means I don't want anyone staying quiet when I'm asking questions. Answering questions is one thing. So on day one, if you study day one, you would have here the way moths protect themselves in every three stages. The moths' eggs are hidden so, hidden so, Blank doesn't eat them. What's the blank? Birds. Good. That's the birds. Well, that was too easy for you all. Now let's let other people participate in this one. The next table. For one word. The pupa is so... Oh, man, I forgot the word. It's so hidden. So blank and blank. Okay, so blank What doesn't eat them. What's this one? Here. It's on, it's on day one. You can name one of the animals of all four spots. It says eat them. Bear. Yes, but that was, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Bears is one of them, which is the last one. Um, and what's next? So we have two other animals. We have three other animals. Lizards? Yes, lizards. Next. No, in the same family, but no. You ever got a guess? Come on, they're related. One lives on land, the other one lives in the water. Toad? Yes, exactly. Uh, and the last one, one we have here, and everybody, practically everyone is scared of. Come on. Snakes. Yes, exactly. And they fly at night to avoid getting eating, eaten by all animals during the day. Yeah. Well. Yeah, bats do, but that, I'm talking about moths. They, they fly at night to, get, uh, to avoid getting eaten. And so as you can see here, in their egg stage, the moth hides her eggs under a leaf normally. So that leaf is flipped upside down. And, and it's usually hidden under leaves so that animals don't get them, like the bird. But even sometimes, you have some birds that are very pesky, and they'll flip over the leaf and eat the eggs. And so... Then you have the pupa. This is open already. Somebody opened this. It's not supposed to be opened. And so they wrap themselves in their own silk, and they make like a form like a ball on a leaf or under the ground or in a burrow. And they're in a chrysalis at that time. But as you know, even bears will eat them. Does weather affect moths? Yes. Yes, it does. Exactly. Cold weather and storms. Will affect, will affect the insects, which could threaten the life of an adult moth as well. Because, you know, it can damage its wings through the storm. Okay, now where's the moth on this picture? Where? Where, 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 where? Right here? No. Right here? No. Here? No. Here? No. Good. You all saw. Good. Good eyes. 
So, as you can see, that is um, camouflage. I forgot to bring my thing. So I have a, has anyone here ever seen a camouflage, anything, anything camouflage? Okay, have, have you ever seen a hunter of any sort? So most of the time, they'll dress in brown to green leaf colors on their shirts. And you know what that's for? So animals don't see them while they're trying to get them. So don't you think that the moth has the same exact point so that animals don't see them so they don't get eaten? So they have to camouflage away from, their an from the enemies. Moths flying at night. Has anyone ever here ever seen a moth at night? Yeah. Is that the only time you see them? Sometimes you see them during the day. Sleeping. And so as you know, at night you may you might have noticed moths attracted to the porch light. Anyone here has a porch light in their house? If you look out your window at night, you'll see a bunch of, if you leave it open, and you'll see a bunch of moths on it. So I have one big question for you all. This, is, this doesn't have to be answered now. But where do you think has the most moths, in the country or in the city? Country. Well, no, it's in the city. Because moths have to do with light pollution as well because they're attracted to light. As you know, moths, they will follow, they use the moon and the stars to guide them. And as, so the light, they tr kind of tricks them into thinking that it's the moon and the stars, so they follow after it. And so, yeah. And then, but Jonathan and his armor bearer were gu guided by God and the light of lights when going up to the Philistines. Like that. So it looks like this at night sometimes. So mods, coloring, and markings. Anyone have any questions so far or comments? OK. Some mods are very colorful. They have wing patterns that m with many different shapes and patterns. Color and pattern are important to mods for camouflage or to let others know where they are. Now, what's camouflage? Let me see. We're all paying attention. Answer my question. Something else, like, like something else looks like others, like something else, but it's not that really. Yes. Good. Yes, you defined that very well. What do you think? Is this a hornet or a moth? moth. Exactly. It's called the clear wing hornet moth. It flies in the day. One of the only moths that fly in the day. Yeah, it's a moth. Seriously. And it looks like a wasp. Which tricks birds into, you know, birds won't eat moths. Most birds won't eat moths. I mean, hornet, because of the poison the hornet carries. So this moth is actually, so far what I studied, it's actually kind of harmless. So to humans, exactly. And so the, so the moth is tricked into thinking that it's not going to eat it because it's a hornet. So that protects itself. That's one way it, it camouflages. And then you have, what's this one? It's a moth. Yes, it's a moth. But is it poisonous or is it not? Poisonous. Exactly. Somebody studied his lesson this week. Man. What about this one? Yes, it is. It still is. It's yellow and black. When it's red and black or yellow and black, that means it's poisonous. Well, I don't see it anywhere, but yeah. Sort of like, you have it on your table, Aaron, I think. You can hold it up for everybody to see. You had a butterfly on your table that looked red. No, it was a toy. It looked like a little toy. Yeah, it was a toy. yeah exactly, like that. It's sort of that color. And so you have uh, number two of moths and color, uh, coloring and markings. You have another way that moths protect themselves is, the flash, is to flash their colors, mm -hmm. which is kind of like, in order to keep their enemies away, they'll move their wings like fast, a little fast, and it bothers the bird's eyes. So it makes the bird go away. Most moths that are red and black or yellow and black taste bad to birds. You want to eat something that tastes bad? No. Exactly. So I'm sure the birds think the same way. Have you ever eaten anything that tastes bad? Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, does this remind you of anything? Cars? No, in the lesson. Anything in the lesson? We just spoke about. Markings and colors, people. And so when, when the light is on this, what do you think you're supposed to do in the road? Stop, 
When your lightning is on this, what do you think you're supposed to do in the road? Go. This one. Good. Where do you think Saul was in his life? Where do you think he needed to be in his life, actually? Um, green. Mm, I think he was too much on the green side. I think he needed to kind of, you know, kind of get on the yellow side, cautiously slow down, because he was too fast, you know? Like, he did this, the sacrifice without even Eli, um, Samuel being there, yeah. which was, I found, very impulsive. So, yeah. Saul needed to be on the yellow light, because he had such an impulsive spirit. Is it good to have an impulsive spirit? No. No, no it's not. Many moths have markings on their wings that look like eyes and scare their enemies away. This is where Aaron's picture comes in handy. Can you hold it up, Aaron? That picture Aaron has is a picture of an owlet moth. And they, they, they fool their enemies into thinking they're owls, you know? Multiple eyes and big eyes as well, like this. Yeah, so if they're on like a tree or something, birds will avoid them because they'll think it's a moth, and then there's an uh, owl, and yeah. just go away. And so is this one. Moths can be poisonous. In what stage are they most poisonous? You find the most poisonous. Well, no, because they're in their chrysalis, remember? In their cocoon. No, actually, the, most, the ones that have the most poisonous is the caterpillar. Comes, it's poisonous in their hair. Remember how most moths are attracted that are red and black or yellow and black taste bad. Yep. Some examples of hairy caterpillars are the garden tiger moth, the wood tiger moth, and the ermine moth. These have poisonous spines that irritate the throats of birds. One try, never again. Like this, that's the... That is the... Harry caterpillar, that is the garden tiger moth. I didn't touch it before. And that's the wood tiger moth. The, see, the color on them kind of resembles the fact that they're poisonous, the red and, because this is kind of red. It's orange, but yeah, it's kind of an orange. But it's red and, it's almost like a red and black, so it shows that it's going to taste bad in the, throat's mouth, in the bird's mouth and can be poison, it's poisonous. I don't think it has enough poison to poison you, but it will irritate your hand. It's shown that it will irritate it, it, your hand. If you put it on your hand, it'll irritate you. The only one that won't do that is the woolly bear that looks like this. Yeah, now that one won't poison you because it has no poison. And yeah, so that's it. Now I need people, this is where you all come in handy with me right now, please. I need everyone speaking. Like, what did you understand from this lesson? I want your point of view from nature side. Starting with table one. Me. <laughs> Me. If not, we can skip to table two. Well, yeah, let us think. Okay, table two. Should I have enough time to think? <laughs> the nature lesson. Any big thing that flew at your brain? Nothing? Table one. Like your, yeah, like your, Give so them time to think. What came to my mind when you said that a lot of the moths, you know, were attracted to the lights, you know, they, uh, especially in the city, so there was more moths in the city. Sometimes we in our Christian, sometimes we in our Christian walk um, are um, misled by not the light, um, the word of God. Sometimes we're, yeah, the fake... <laughs> The fake lights, right? So we need to be uh, diligent in, the, in our word and the Bible, searching to make sure that we are indeed um, following the word of God in the lamp, that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So. so table two has gotten their answer. Yana, you have something to say? Um, how the um, eyes um, of the moth, how um, sometimes they fools us into getting trapped. And then how they how they how the moths fool the birds into thinking they're owls or they're something else. So then they don't they don't get them. Yep. Yeah. Table two. I hope you had enough time to think. If not, we can skip to table three. <laughs> well. Um, Thank you. 
you know, you talked about Saul being um, rash in his um, actions. As Christians, we are not supposed to be rash in our actions. I think some part of, uh, I think it's in, in Samuel, um, first Samuel that talks about obedience is better than sacrifice. So that was what Samuel told Saul when he did not, you know, try to wait and obey the time of sacrifice. So he added up all his impulse. So we need to be careful so we don't, you know, make rash decisions. Yep. So that's where the yellow light comes in handy. Table three. This is my parents' table, so I hope they have everything to say. <laughs> that was surprising. Table four. Who's going to be the talker on this table? Table five, you should have time to think. And that includes all of you on the back. Yeah, all of you are table five. Okay, in the nature lesson, I, I heard you speaking about um, the moth and the colors and the markings. Uh, they flash um, their color. It says inside you that they're red on the wing and the moth. They flash it at enemies. And so I was thinking about Saul. Saul was on a mission to utterly destroy the enemy. And then I remember an instance inside Jesus' story when he was uh, going when he was in Gethsemane and they asked, he asked the soldiers and the leaders, who do you look for? Who do you seek? Right? And when they told him in an instant, he turned around and said, I am he. And they all fell back. And then I trans, I transitioned that to us, the reserve and the character of Christ in us today, as we go to utterly, have Christ eliminate sin in our lives because Christ was on the way to the cross to pay the price for wiping out sin in our life. I said, what's going to flash before people today as we go into these last days? What's going to cause people to realize who Christ is? And it says that when it flashed their underwing color, the enemy is frightened and runs away. And so I'm wondering, what's our, what, what's our coloring, right? Our markings. Well, uh, I passed uh, this experience, um, I believe on February 2nd. I went to this place and um, as a, it was a, a long line, I was, standing up on the line, and uh, individually people have to wait to speak with the officer. So this officer opened the door, he looked at me, in, and uh, he spoke some word, and he says, this is the guy I'm looking for. So I remained silent in that moment, because sometimes I'm so quick to, to speak. and. Uh, I told him, oh yes, you was looking for me. And uh, he went throughout my paper and he said, listen, how you doing? I said, I'm doing pretty good. I said, okay, I'm going to see you next year. But one thing I see, because if I react quickly to speak, something worse could happen to me there. Even if I'm right, but I had to wait for a silence on that moment. That's what I, I learned. about the moth um, being more in the city because of the reflection of the light and the move by you know the light they see. That also reminds me that God is a God of light. You remember the time of the, um, the children of Israel when they were going through the wilderness, he was what? A pillar of what? In the what? In the, in the night, right? So that they could see. So you could see that um, if we, just like, um, um, Jonathan and the Amubiara, they, they went through the night, and what was God to them? He was the light. So we have to make God the light of our lives so that he will lead us to the right path. Yep. Table five. 
overall been thinking because you had a long time to answer. Super long time. Who's going to be the speaker? Good. So I thought it was very interesting how the moth, um, it camouflages and it looks like something else in order um, not to get eaten. And so I was thinking about that and that we too, we need to look like something else. We need to camouflage, not camouflage, but we need to look more like Jesus when people see us. And that's the only way we will get saved. One of uh, the biggest lessons that I actually drew when you were showing the cut um, the mouth with big eyes, and we just looked at each other with Daniel, and then we he, Daniel asked me, "How could they do that?" And then right suddenly I came to realize that's how God loves us. He knew what we will go through in this life. He thought ahead of time. He said that these will be weaker uh, vessels. And so he planned, he put those colors into the mouth so that when they go to look for food, they will look like other big animals so that they will actually survive in that, in that, in that moment. So. The lesson that I took out of that, it's the love of God who loved us even before we were there, and he put everything in place to protect us, to give us that peace and that enjoyment, even though we're living through this sinful life. So I praise God for his thoughtfulness and love for us. So you all remember the hornet moth that I shared about? Remember, I, I didn't remember to uh, say this one, but it doesn't fly in a straight line. Why is that? So it doesn't get caught. And so do all other moths. They don't fly in straight lines. And so if I walk like this, and somebody's behind me trying to catch me, and I just walk, and I just run straight, you think they're going to catch me faster than I do zigzags? Yeah. Have you, who's, who here has ever played tag? How do you run when you play tag? You go zigzag or you go straight? Zigzag. Good, why? Mots do the same exact thing. So now I'm going to lay this down on my mom because she's going to do the spiritual part. Thank you for participation. I need six helpers, please. The ones that could read. I'm sorry. <laughs> the ones that could read. Six helpers. I need one if it could. Okay, good. Six helpers. This will be yours. Let it kill up. This one will be yours. Okay. I need two more, please. Two more. I'll do one. Okay. If we didn't want it to, so there was four, you could be over here. Okay. No, I don't. John is one, he's two. You want me to see? Yeah. Number five, and you're number six. I will pass this. Okay, now this is connected with um, this is connected with nature, and it also have to give us, especially for the youth, uh, an idea how to um, use their character quality. Okay, and see if you could get the clue. What is the character quality? Our children, as they enter their teen years, are like a caterpillar going into his cocoon. cocoon. Okay, cocoon. A metal fuzzes. I don't know this word. Okay, is about to take place. 
the caterpillar is being transformed into a butterfly. The youth is being transformed into an adult. Have you ever watched a butterfly come out of his cocoon? Yeah. Yeah? You have? Wow. It is a very vulnerable time, and he needs a safe environment. It takes time and effort to crawl out, to stretch his legs, to uncurl his antenna, and to begin to straighten his wings. He doesn't fly immediately. He perches near his old cocoon and, gentle, and gently begins to move his wings. Back and forth, he exercises them until they are dry and his muscles have begun to strengthen. Then he takes a short flight, increasing them in length until he's ready for long migration. Our youth need a safe home environment where their growing powers where their growing powers can develop not too fast and not too slow. They need encouragement to exercise their wings, their abilities to go to God for themselves and put him in charge of their lives. As they gain experience in successful flight, with little things, they can be stretched with bigger challenges. Oh, maybe I need another. <laughs> can someone read for the butterfly that is not allowed to emerge from his cocoon at the proper time either dies or is crippled. His wings don't open properly and he is vulnerable to predators. Likewise, a youth that is not allowed freedom to exercise his decision-making ability under God is crippled. His trust in God is stifled. His confidence that God can and will direct him personally is confused. He becomes vulnerable to Satan's snares. On the other hand, a caterpillar forced from its cocoon too early faces similar disadvantages. Any youth that is launched out into the world without the proper preparation of knowing God and how to exercise his wings to do God's will instead of the will of his flesh will fall prey to Satan. Without the wings of decision for a godly life being developed, there is no true flight. And last, these butterflies will be crippled for life unless they find God, trust and submit to him being in, charge of their, being in charge of their life and follow his lead to face the misconceptions of their childhood and replace them with right conceptions. All can mature in Christ by letting him reparent them. These wings can be healed and developed in him. to exercise thank you this decision making ability under god is crippled and i see that today even in my own life when i don't make decisions on time or i'm not seeking the lord in prayer it really is a hindrance to me and i see that you know god wants us to be people who are firm and stand for you know what is right and just so i see that in my own experience that um it's so important to teach our children to choose and to say yay or nay and not to be like a double-minded man like the Bible says, you know, who wavers. So God help us to raise children that are like that and to be people that are like that. Thank you. No, something that was very standing out to me was that it was taking its time. It didn't go out once right away. It, take, it took its time to, to strengthen its muscles, to dry its wings. So it teaches me a lesson that 
sometimes I just want to go and work right away, but I need to first uh, learn, be trained, and develop more character. So um, the verse in Proverbs that says, train up a child in the way he must grow, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Um, I also thought of that scripture. And depending on the way we raise our child in the fear of the Lord or without a love of God, it, it will influence whether they'll be able to fly or be crippled in life. But because the beginning of this is these butterflies will be crippled for life unless they find God. But it also gives hope because it also says that all can mature in Christ by letting him reparent them. Yeah. And so even though, depending on how a child is raised, it will influence whether they'll be crippled in life or not, it also shows that even if that child's beginning was crippled, mm -hmm. Christ can reparent them and give them the ability to fly again. Well, one thing, a couple things, is that where it says that the youth need a safe home environment where they can grow their powers. Uh, not too fast, not too slow, but it's just that, emph that emphasize again that home is a school where, where they learn. So it says that especially they need encouragement to exercise their wings, their ability to go to God for themselves. So many children, um, things that they do, you know, coming to church is because I have heard a lot, they are forced by parents, but they're not instructed. They are not explained why do you have to, um, to go to church? Why do you have to pray? So at home is that where that training star, because the time will come that Parents will not be able to stand for the children. They themselves have to make that decision. So the home should be um, a place where it provides that for them, especially when they are little. I wish I could say that. I learned it earlier, but praise God that everything has its time. So now that I'm learning to, to stand for God for myself, so it's, I just see these children like very privileged to what they have, but later on, uh, the parents will see the, the benefit of all this education and, and training of their child. I wanted to piggyback sort of on what Sister Andrea was saying. Um, on here it says um, to have them exercise, and this is just a personal experience. I'm not saying this is for everybody. But when we were home, and a little bit when we first came here to UG Pines, there's a nursing home nearby, and we would visit people and on the island that we moved to, there's a whole lot of elderly people. And one thing that stuck out in my mind, even in reserve, talking about exercise, having the children be able to exercise as they mature, and exercising how to fly. You know, how do Christians behave? How do we do God's work? And the children, sometimes they would comment, or one point in time they commented and said, I was like asking them, so why are you guys looking so sad when we went there? It was like, it smells so bad inside there, daddy. Because you know elderly persons, sometimes they need a diaper change, or they just, you know. And so when I <laughs> was reading that hearing about exercise, exercising reserve to do what God is asking them to do, or do the will of God, as my card said, how to exercise flying like a moth or a butterfly. And they, just, they stuck it out. And by the grace of God, as we explained why it is that way and that, you know, smelly, smelly, stinky situations come in life and you have to face them, you can't, like, run out on it, right? Same way that person was able to smile because you sung that song or brought that card. It's worth going into that smelly situation for it. So that came to my mind about exercising the wings of... The butterfly. Thank you for everybody that helped. Okay, um, that has been a blessing, and it's taken from a book that I don't know. Um, 
anyways, but it, the name of the book is Parenting Your Teen by the Spirit. So I myself, the reason why I went digging for this book is because I needed to know how to be a parent. Um, especially because I had a, tw a teen ear that was different. So I don't want my children to be the same. So I went search, but it has been a blessing to me. Sorry. Okay, so for the children, now we're going to switch a little bit. In our story, that in the little bit that they were reading to us, we see that there is um, something that, as I don't know if as they were reading, if you kind of compare um, the lesson that we studied last week, the life of Saul and Dave and Jonathan, what, what they were reading, right? It seems like um, Saul did not have that wing. He did not at least train that wing of making decision at the early age, right? So therefore, when he was later on as a king, everything he tried to do was quick, was in the rush, without thinking, without bringing it to prayer to God to see what was the right way. And therefore, we saw that he led a lot of people to, um, can I say, destruction, right? Um, but at the same time, in the same lesson, we saw it, um, Samuel, which was a man of prayer, right? That always I thought about stop or yielding, right? Saul was always on the go, but he was always stopping or yielding to see what was God's will, pray to see what was God's will for his life. And even with Jonathan, see, the father was completely opposite from the son, right? Jonathan was the son, but he, he even when the father is trying to make sacrifice, doing other things to get ready to go to, go to the word, his son went to God first, right? And God was able to help him. Just those two, with the, God's help, they were able to conquer the Philistine, right? Um, so we saw the difference in Jonathan's life, even though his father didn't have the good character. So with God, I believe any children could do what the parent cannot do, right? And we also saw his helper, his, I would say, his companion, his friend, that was a man of prayer, of faith. And them two talking together, they were able to make the right decision, to, and God was able to use them, right? And then we also learn about young Dave, became one of my favorite Bible stories. I actually suggested my son to read just the life of Dave. Um, a young boy grew up out in the field. As I read the father about all the eight children, all the seven children before the prophet um, Samuel, I thought it was almost like the parents say, he's too small. It's n it's, no, I don't see anything that is worthy on him, right? But God saw what, what that maybe I cannot see on my children, right? God saw that on Dave, and what did he do? He waited until he was brought to him, and then he chose him to be a king. And then, because he was um, a man of reserve, so what did he do? He went back to the field, doing his job as he was doing, and then later on, he came to the king to the palace and he was able to minister to bless Saul right to bless Saul through music and all these things and also to learn how to be um, a leader later on right so God could train us even if we if we didn't receive that train in childhood um, so in your table we I believe we have few minutes um, you have some contrast and compare that I like the children to bring it up with the help of parent. You're going to see which one belongs where. Okay? So on your table, what do you have? Parents can help now. And 
and you could bring them up front with the help of a parent will make a decision where do they go that's comp compare and contrast in the character of these uh, people Where's the parents? Uh, <laughs> sorry. What, what, do we, what do we need to say? Just uh, the tape mm -hmm. so, so what do you have? So they know. Modest shepherd boy. Modest shepherd boy. Who do you think that was? Oh, no. David. David. Okay. Next person. What do you have, Josania? You have impatience. Who do you think was impatient? Saul. Saul. Handsome Manly. Handsome Manly. Who do you think that is? David. David, good. Is it David or Saul? Because Manly was uh, Saul, right? Saul. Well, it also said that David was handsome and manly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Restless and rash. Who do you think that is, Naomi? Saul. Saul. Okay. Restless and rash. It's yours. Delia, what do you have? Man of faith and moved by a divine impulse. Man of faith and prayer? Oh, I know who, mm, that, is. who that is. Do you remember? Man of faith is David and moved by a divine impulse is Saul. Uh, divine impulse. Starts with a J. Son of, uh, uh, the son of Saul. Saul yeah, the son of Saul. Jonathan. <laughs> Okay, what do you have? Josania have impulsive. Who was impulsive? I don't know what it means. Impulsive Saul. who was quick to act. Saul. Saul. Okay. How about you, Sister Ruth? So the adult table in the back had the disobedient and obedient to God's command. So I can see how Saul was disobedient and uh, obedient to God's command. David, Jonathan was a friend of David. Um, Samuel was quite uh, obedient to God's command as well. Good, good, thank you. Okay, now on your table we had um, the days that if you have something to share, you could just put your hands up and this is the time where you share. What do you, something about our lesson, spiritual, nature, according to those days that is on your table. For me, something that really stood out was that Saul thought he was obeying God. He really did think he was obeying. And that, to me, is just uh, um, kind of like a warning for self-reflection and constantly seeking the word of God uh, when we might think we, we are obeying the word of God. Um, also, that Samuel, as he saw Saul, uh, he was very grieved. He was really sad. And even God had to come to him and say, how long will you mourn over Saul? You know, so he was really, really sorrowful that Saul had you know, walked out of the path of righteousness. And then um, I also said that Samuel loved Saul as his own, like, son. Yes, yes. That's 
sure that he cared, right? Anybody else? So something I didn't know about David's anointing, I thought that it had been, and the whole family had seen it, but it was kept secret from them. And so David, he was the only one that knew that he was chosen by God to be the king. And he didn't tell his family. He was reserved and held it and very humble. That takes a lot of humility because he could have said, oh, I'm the king. Why are you treating me this way? Why are you treating me this way? No. But he was very humble to, to take. And even as he went to the king's palace, he was just there serving the king, even though he knew he was the, the, the king, right? So that, that in itself can teach us many lessons. Yeah. Anybody else? Did I see Sister Teresa hands up? No. There's a contrast again with Saul, with what um, Brother Daniel said about uh, David. Saul was to have reserve and not to war for his own glory, to win battles and to feel important or be important and, fam and famous. So Saul did this thing and did not reserve, and he wanted to take the glory for himself, and he didn't even do what God asked him to do. So he didn't really obey, which he thought he did, but he didn't. And so David was reserved and keeping his anointing, his God's choice on him, you know, to himself, and was willing to let everything take its course for God to get the glory, but Saul wasn't willing to do that. He just came forward and he said, I did it. And he was the one who brought that up into his mind. So that's a great contrast on even today in reserve, being willing to let the other or God be glorified or the other person um, or defer everything back to God. Okay. Anybody else have something? Um, just one thing. I, we were hearing a lot about camouflage, and so I was thinking about that a lot. And camouflage is actually a good thing for butterflies against their enemies. But one thing that the, that the Israelites were doing is they were trying to camouflage to be like the nations around them when they chose to have a king. So camouflage is not always a good thing necessarily. We have to, like again, be, not be rash, but be reserved and pray. You know, when is it good to camouflage and when is it good not to camouflage? Because we are called to be a peculiar people. So that's, that's one way where we don't want to camouflage and blend in with everyone else is by taking their customs and habits. Okay. Thank you. All right. Can I ask somebody to pray to close? Dear Jesus, thank you for the say, and thank you that we get to do Sabbath school. In Jesus' name, amen.